you gotta do better. <laughs> 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 oh, that's like, uh, I can't stop thinking. Moving on from Warren, I, we're gonna spend the rest of the show talking about Mayor Pete because, as vexing as Warren is to me, holy shit, I hate this motherfucker, Pete Buttigieg, so much. And here's the thing. I didn't think it was possible, but Mayor Pete is more evil than Joe Biden, and I'll tell you exactly why. Joe Biden has a record that's unparalleled in being one of the most damaging to our oh, society yeah. in, in the history of American politics. We can take that as read. Mayor Pete has, like we said, been the mayor of you know a, a city in Indiana. That's yeah. all he's done so far. He, he got eight thousand. He won by eight thousand. He got eight thousand votes last time. More people voted in my poll. Uh, what is the best car to crash into a wall <laughs> dying instantly? So, By about a thousand, actually. So, here's the thing. Despite the fact that Mayor Pete's record of evil is still relatively contained, Mayor Pete is more evil than Joe Biden because he is saying, I am auditioning to be and represent all of the same things Joe Biden has done and uh, throughout his career, but I'm auditioning to be that guy in 2019. Yeah. And continue that for another 30 fucking years. Yeah. So, like, that is the fucking, like, the, that is what is so evil about him. Also, Joe Biden, like, the charming thing about Joe Biden to me is that he has been on the wrong side of pretty much every decision in the Democratic Party. Every for, single one. Like, pretty much, like, almost years. his entire adult life. As and, long as I've been alive, and yet, basically. He personally, you know, forgoing his sons, he personally. He's just not profited from it at all. <laughs> like his idea of like getting one over is he like makes a bill where it's like, all right, it's illegal for a prosecutor to ever even talk to an investment banker. Like it's you, if you go bankrupt, your bank can kill you, can enslave your kids. And he's like, all right, well, we got a, we got an AIG windbreaker out of this. <laughs> it's getting pretty cold out. Joe, you just saved yourself upwards of ninety dollars. <laughs> like he just he's horribly in debt for most of his life. Just doesn't just like he always toots his horn about being the poorest senator, but it's like, yeah, that means he's just like did this for the love of the game because yeah. he likes shaking people's hands. He just likes going to meetings. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but Pete, you know, pizza, pizza McKinsey bloodsucker. Pete is, he's already personally profited off the rot. Pete is the baby that Vigo the Carpathian tries to put <laughs> his spirit into at the end and of the And it's like slightly Busters turning too. into his face yeah. at the end. Yeah, yeah, Vigo yeah. is Joe Biden and the baby is Pete Buttigieg. No, imagine being in 2019, being like, yeah, I'm going to be the n next Joe Biden and support all the policies that he sta has stood for over yeah. his career in 2019. But he just thinks that it's a way to power. That's all he cares about. He has, well, he has no... See, and that's the other thing that makes him worse than Biden. I do believe that Biden has some sort of jumbled up ideology in his head that he thinks, like, equals, like, American greatness. Like, he closes his eyes and he imagines, like, a, a, a kid eating a hot dog in a Cub Scout uniform. And, <laughs> and like, he, he imagines that he's making America like that. You know, it's like uh, this... Yeah, yeah, but, uh, uh, Mayor Pete has nothing. Like, when you say, what do you believe? It's just a blank screen. Just power for its own sake. Yeah, Mayor Pete, like, if you sat Joe Biden down in a room and you're like, you asked him to, like, explain his platform, you would actually get an answer. It would be indecipherable. It would, you know, it'd just be like, you know, there's a little league game and the, the poor kids, they're hanging out with the rich kids, but they're all having a good time. And the thing was, you know, back then, you know, back then, okay, Latino guys didn't, didn't ride bicycles. <laughs> And we get them riding bikes, <laughs> and that's really you. You know, you you remember you remember back then. You remember back then. We didn't know what the hell lipstick was. <laughs> we thought women women's lips were just getting redder and redder and redder, and we did plum didn't know what the hell to do about it. And you know, that's really what it's all about is coming together and go, hey, what the hell are you putting on there? <laughs> <laughs> and but like it would just be insane. It would be word salad. It would be. Something in there about like it would be the montage from Parallax View, right? But Mayor Pete, like he would just he would try to do the Mayor Pete dance. <laughs> he doesn't <laughs> have an answer. He does not have an answer at all. So there are are, are two uh, big stories about uh, Pete Buttigieg that I want to uh, spend the rest of the show talking about. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> 
Uh, the first comes <laughs> courtesy of uh, Ryan Grimm and The Intercept. And I would also like to uh, shout out and thank Ryan Grimm uh, on the show for actually putting us in touch with uh, Catherine uh, for that interview about uh, Bolivia. That was great. Good so, looking out, Ryan. Uh, good looking out, Ryan Grimm. This is uh, in The Intercept. Pete Buttigieg touted three major supporters of his Douglas plan for black America. They were alarmed when they saw it. And like this story is basically the Pete Buttigieg campaign is a brochure for a uh, small liberal arts college <laughs> in the Northeast that has just photoshopped like a, it's just a bunch of smiling college kids. And then just like a, a Photoshop, like, like Samuel L. Jackson stock photo yep. into the brochure, yep. you know, touting uh, their diverse community and support. But you can still see the watermark like on the face. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna start reading here. Uh, in July, uh, he released his campaign's chief piece of policy outreach to black voters called The Douglas Plan, a comprehensive investment in the empowerment of black America. The plan covers everything from criminal justice reform to public health care, education, and beyond. It proposes using federal contracting rules to increase the amount of contracts going to minority and women-owned firms to 25% and offers student loan deferment and forgiveness to Pell Grant recipients who go on to start businesses that employ at least three people. <laughs> that's literally... That's this. I cannot believe it. That's the second time I'm seeing this exact policy. <laughs> Didn't... Yeah, Kamala had this exact thing. Yeah. And, like the response was just people making fun of it, and now yeah. she's just got to pretend like she never put it out there. And yeah. it's like that sounds great. And by the way, that policy that's just a gentrifying supercharger. Yeah, because the people who are going to be in a position to take out the money or have access to the money to start a small business uh, that soon after college in urban areas are going to be white. Basic, I mean, overwhelmingly, like it's it's just it doesn't even do what it's supposed to do, and it's it's. It's amazing. It's, it's like, like it's supposed like the fucking benefit of this stuff is that it's supposed to micro target the exact people that are need to be helped and not be all oh universal programs oh rich people get some of that it doesn't help the people who need it it's too profligate this is supposed to help exactly who needs it and it doesn't even do that this is a bill it's like he went into Bushwick and was like hmm there aren't enough bars called honey plus salt. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, need, we need it to just be entirely that. So uh, uh, when pressed on the lack of black support, Buttigieg and his campaign have made repeated references to the Douglas plan, named for abolitionist Frederick Douglas. Uh, to build support for the plan, Buttigieg and his staff lobbied prominent black South Carolinians to endorse it in order to strengthen the cause of racial justice. The Washington Post reported on Monday that Buttigieg persuaded hundreds of prominent black South Carolinians to sign on to the plan, even if they are not supporting Buttigieg himself. Along with the release of the plan, his campaign directed consultants to convene focus groups with undecided black voters in South Carolina. The resulting research memo, finalized in late July, concluded that Buttigieg's sexuality was a barrier to winning support among black voters. The memo was leaked to the press this fall. Okay, Let's read through the lines there. Buttigieg's campaign is seeing the polling that he has less than 1% African-American support overall, but especially in South Carolina, which, you know, you got to show yeah. out there. It's like the third Democratic primary. Yeah. And it, I saw a poll this week that said that Buttigieg was leading in Iowa and had like a 14-point bounce, which I'm sorry, That's I, don't, I poll. don't believe. It's an outlier. And honestly, even if he is leading in polls right now, at the same time in 2011 was Herman Cain. And I just really feel like Buttigieg is Herman Cain with the roller backpack. He's a flash in the pan. But uh, no, I want to be clear about this thing about convening a focus group uh, about his African-American support and then leaking it to the press. His campaign convened a focus group to, that, to find an answer for why he has such tepid support among uh, African-Americans. And of course, it's a focus group. So you, you know, design it to give you the yeah. answer you want and leak to the press, which is surprise, surprise. Black people are just too homophobic yep. to support Mayor Pete. Yep. Which is interesting because he must just be using that as like an excuse for his current white supporters. Yeah. So that yeah, they don't feel yeah. weird about it. It's like, well, yeah. you know, he would have more, but they're just a little. There's a problem a in that community. You know? yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's Otherwise, a, they would support him so they could feel better about their support yeah, exactly. for Mayor Pete. And right. again, uh, fun game to play here about any of this article. Imagine if the Bernie campaign did <laughs> yeah, any of Jesus this. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like it is not since not since Prop 8, since people tried to like blame Prop 8 on homophobic black voters. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
it's a throwback. Mayor Pete, like for all his forward positioning and like sort of tilt towards a we a weird type of LinkedIn futurism, is a throwback. Like more than Biden is. Well, Biden is sort of like he, the main message of his campaign is like, do you want it to feel like, you know, 2009 again? Yeah. Mayor Pete is living there. Yeah. Like that, it, it's that, ty- that type of exact type of liberalism. The come back to 2009. Remember, we all loved the oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mayor Peach just like yeah he should have rage comics on his on, <laughs> like in, in place of his policy section which he didn't have for like six months on his <laughs> website. I mean yeah if Bernie yeah imagine if Bernie said that black people didn't vote for him because they're homophobic. Right. First he, point out like right we'd first point out that yeah. Bernie isn't gay and he's lying. <laughs> so like there's a huge huge thing right there. So so uh, going on now. Three days later, the Buttigieg campaign began promoting a list of 400 South Carolinian supporters of his Douglas plan in emails to reporters and posts on social media. The supporters were rolled out in a press release open letter published in the HBCU Times, which focuses on positive news related to historically black colleges and universities. Listed at the top of the press release were three prominent supporters, Columbia City Councilwoman Tamika Devine, Baptist pastor and state representative Ivory Thigpen, and Johnny Cord- uh, Cordero, chair of the state party's Black Caucus. There is one presidential candidate who has proven to have intentional policies designed to make a difference in the black experience, and that's Pete Buttigieg, read the open letter released along with the plan. That really sounds like an endorsement. The blowback came immediately. Devine, who had not endorsed a candidate yet in the presidential election, told The Intercept that she did not intend her support for the plan to be read as an endorsement for Buttigieg's candidacy and believes the campaign was intentionally vague about the way it was presented. Asked if she knew if any of the black supporters of the plan were also supporters of Buttigieg, she said she wasn't sure. The only ones I really know were me and Representative Thigpen, she said. I don't know many actually now to think about it other than the folks working on Mayor Pete's campaign. Thigpen, meanwhile, has endorsed Senator Bernie Sanders for president and was startled when he learned that the campaign had not only attached his name to the plan, but also listed him as one of the top three supporters atop the letter. Here is the really amazing part. The way they did this is that they sent people an email about this and said, not responding to this email will be used as evidence of your support and endorsement of Bur- oh, uh, God. Pete Buttigieg. See, brilliant, brilliant. That's why I am still charged every month for my browser subscription. <laughs> the same, tri- the yeah, same no, technique. After the publication, the Buttigieg campaign said it had sent the plan to a list of supporters and asked them to opt out if they did not want their name <laughs> included on the list. The email also specifically said that the list was meant to represent over 400 black South Carolinians. And then, of course, it came out that like maybe half of them were just white people. Yeah. Uh, the Buttigieg campaign said that they have never claimed that the list was exclusively prominent black South Carolinians and that it's important to have a multiracial coalition to support the end goal of racial justice. <laughs> okay, and then also, as part of this, uh, this plan, the, uh, the Buttigieg campaign uses stock footage of a Kenyan woman... <laughs> To represent <laughs> their support among that's literally the Black college South- pamphlet thing. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay, oh, that's like all those guys who are on Twitter with blacks for Trump, where they just grab it off of Shutterstock. Amazing. Yeah, no. But what I love so much about they're like, uh, please respond to opt out of this endorsement <laughs> by reading this email. You have agreed to endorse Pete Buttigieg and his Frederick Douglass plan. Amazing. Imagine if, imagine if Bernie Sanders. Just did think that. about it, folks. Just imagine if. He Just did think that. about it for a minute. Yeah. And all, of, imagine all of the people who love and support Pete Buttigieg and attack Sanders all the time. Uh, what, what has been their response to this? I'm not talking about it, to my understanding. But here's my favorite thing about this: the whole thing about like how the, the creating a focus group to give you an answer that you can leak to the press that like basically slanders the black community as being homophobic for not supporting you, Pete Buttigieg, and your plan to uplift you know yeah. uh, black people in America, and then being like you know by by looking at this email, you have uh, agreed to <laughs> respond to the email within an hour. If you, you know <laughs> that to me, this is all McKinsey mindset. This oh, yeah. is what he learned at McKinsey. And the other big article out about this week about Buttigieg, Pete Buttigieg is even more interesting to me because 
I just thought, like, okay, we saw those pictures of him in Afghanistan, like holding a rifle and like, yeah. looking down the barrel at it, giving, <laughs> you know, holding like you know, holding it the wrong way, or just looking like a complete fucking prat. He was not a gun guy. As yeah, Rachel he was an says. office guy in Afghanistan. Yeah. Then yes. he was like, well, yeah. like it turns out, like the bulk of what he did was economic development in war zones yeah which, hmm, yeah what does that mean okay but like and then and then he and then, oh, he joined mckinsey and i remember learning about that and i was like holy shit like just joining up with one of the most evil outfits imaginable and when that first started happening people started saying that the response was oh come on like the only account he worked on was like a regional grocery chain okay well it turns out that's the reason we know about that is because everything else he did for mckinsey is covered by an nda <laughs> and what he did for them was blood curdling shit about <laughs> yes, as Felix said, promoting security and economic development in war zones. Ah. If you can read that sentence and not just see CIA on it, I don't know what well, the fuck. He he went into Afghanistan and Iraq and looked for Pell Grant recipients. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a this is a this is a piece at at, um, at BuzzFeed by Henry J. Gomez. Pete Buttigieg's work at McKinsey is a secret. But a judge campaign says it reached out to the company about the possibility of being released from a confidentiality agreement, but the mayor has so far stayed quiet. For nearly three years, he worked at McKinsey and Company, an elite management consulting firm with offices around the world. It was work that took him, he has said, to Iraq and Afghanistan. And for years after that, in his early campaigns for public office, Buttigieg held up his stint in McKinsey as a selling point and proof that he was a business-friendly Democrat, while only vaguely describing what he did and never revealing <laughs> his clients. Asked by BuzzFeed News this week if Buttigieg would be willing to provide more information about his role at the firm, spokesman Chris Meager confirmed that the campaign on at least two occasions has asked McKinsey about ways around the non-disclosure pact. Buttigieg's work is largely covered by a non-disclosure agreement, Meager said Friday. Um, McKinsey has become known for working with authoritarian regimes and taking on other ethically complicated projects. A New York Times report last year focused on its work for governments or state-owned companies in China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. A recent lawsuit against the pharmaceutical company that makes OxyContin raised questions about the firm's role in perpetuating the opioid crisis. That is a <laughs> hell of a fucking resume Look, right there. it's ethically complicated, okay? <laughs> yeah. I went on Facebook and I clicked ethically complicated. Mayor Pete is the anti-hero candidate. He's the FX protagonist candidate. Yes, he is. <laughs> He's Jax. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, listen, we got to get out of the deal with the Saudis so we can make the move out of opioids. Yeah. We got to do a deal with the Saudis <laughs> well, yeah, so no, we can get his, out of it. Mayor Pete's policies are exactly as convoluted and non-functional as the sun's. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right, so we go into the neighborhood and we find every Pell Grant recipient, and they're the pe they will lease the guns to us, and then we'll sell them to other Pell Grant recipients in another neighborhood, and then we get the Chinese to sell us guns from the IRA, and then they'll find they'll find people who received over six figures of student loans, and they can get an earned income tax credit to buy the guns back from us. <laughs> uh, no, like, uh, what can you say? But. The crow flies straight for a minute. <laughs> okay. uh, going on. Uh, Buttigieg has in the past described his time at McKinsey, which followed a Harvard education and a Rhodes Scholarship at the University of Oxford as a, so a as a sort of uh. finishing school. In Shortest Way Home, the political memoir he published earlier this year, he wrote that the job was a chance to learn what wasn't on the page and get an education in the real world if there is a... You know, you need to get some street smarts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He graduated from the School of Hard Knocks. So the job also allowed Buttigieg to present himself to Republicans as a businessman and different kind of Democrat when he ran for Indiana State Treasurer in 2010. Isn't that just the exact same kind of Democrat in, in, that they've always had in <laughs> Indiana since, like, fucking Birch by retired? Yeah. It's just like, that's the, like, what's new about that? Check this out. Buttigieg took his McKinsey pitch to a 2010 South Bend forum sponsored by groups aligned with the nascent Tea Party, an audience partial to the Republican incumbent. Quote, I did math for a living around economics. 
<laughs> the economics of energy and the economics of stabilizing very tough places around the world in order to make sure there's less violence there, but a judge told the crowd that night. Well, when you have 50 military-aged males and then you subtract 24 <laughs> military-aged males... Yeah, fifty percent fewer. It's kind of interesting that all of, all of the places where all of the energy is, yeah. all of the violence is there too. Weird. Why does that happen? Um, Buttigieg told the crowd that night. But I got to thinking: if I'm any good at stabilizing economies, <laughs> pacifying <laughs> pacifying populations, and stabilizing moving, their economies, if I'm good at moving weight uh, uh, with Free Ray Rick Ross. Uh, maybe I ought to help try to stabilize the economy right here in Indiana. Wow! To use the same. You know, techniques learned that at McKinsey, his education in the real world, again, stabilizing, read, pacifying yeah. restive populations in, uh, you know, imperial uh, war zones. We need a Phoenix project for America's entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah. So he goes, I got my street smarts working in war zones on economic <laughs> stabilization, Buttigieg told the South Bend Tribune in October 2007. And I think that experience stands up next to anybody's. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, man. And by anybody's, he means all of the characters in James Elroy's Underworld USA <laughs> yes, trilogy. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there's two. If, if you want to put my work up next to Tiger Cab, Tiger <laughs> Camp, <laughs> and all of the Tiger associated cadres, then yeah, yeah let's do it. Uh, I, I just I think that uh, there's two. What his career there in like Iraq was two. One of two things. Either he was a, a fucking spook and he is an actual CIA agent running for president, which is honestly kind of amazing. Just the idea that they're like, fuck it. Like all these billionaires have decided they're going to cut out the middleman. Now the CIA has also decided they're going to cut out the middleman. <laughs> it's like, why do we have to fuck around with these other guys? We'll just have one of our own do it. So he was either doing like deep, deep fucking CIA shit, like fucking uh, Gladio 2 or Give, Gladio Giving B. money to ISIS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, either that or... Best case scenario is he's charging the coalition provisional authority of like five and a half million dollars that could have gone to, you know, fixing the electrical grid or, uh, you know, uh, getting rid of some of the giant piles of open sewage that they had in Baghdad so that they could give, he give them a PowerPoint presentation that's just a bunch of pictures of camels and it says like innovation. <laughs> like that's the yeah. best case scenario of what he did. I mean, the, the big secret of McKinsey beyond just like, complete moral bankruptcy and outright evil is that like the actual work they do that's beyond you know yeah just make a really addictive drug that feels better <laughs> than anything for really cheap is uh just bullshit yeah. it's shit like that it's yeah. just like right it's just like you know going into places and being like you need to optimize your externalities yep. it'll be 17 million dollars yep I mean, so there's, a, there's a lot of money to be made just sort of like overcharging in war zones. It's one of America's biggest growth industries. So I'm sure there was a bit of that. So he goes here. Um, when another reporter asked about McKinsey later that day, Buttigieg downplayed its relevance to his political and professional life. The majority of my career has been in public service, he said. It's not something that I think is essential in my story, but also there's a reason why I write about it quite a bit in my book, and there's a reason why I discuss it whenever it comes up, because I learned a lot there and it shaped my fluency in business issues. Buttigieg devoted most of a 10-page chapter in Shortest Way Home to his work at McKinsey. Back to the U.S. in 2007, he wrote, I landed a job in Chicago at McKinsey and Company, and my classroom was everywhere. A conference room, a serene corporate office, the break room of a retail store, a safe house in Iraq, or an airplane seat. Uh, well, oh, what's up, man? <laughs> well, what? yeah, that's <laughs> a hell of a gear shift there. Oh, uh, yeah. My classroom was everywhere. You know, at, in the university, in the boardroom, on the bus. <laughs> At a black site in <laughs> Syria. Like, I, yeah, what? Through, Hello? Looking, what? looking through a sniper scope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, he never the, did any of that. The, no, oh, no, 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 no. The oil derrick prison from Face Off. <laughs> <laughs> he said, a, a, a safe house in Iraq or an airplane seat, any place that could accommodate me and my laptop. I ain't yeah, me without my laptop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, you, know me, you know me. I got to watch my shows. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dude. The book briefly referenced and Buttigieg occasionally mentions work on efforts to promote energy efficiency and huh. reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm. He went into substantive detail only on one other project grocery pricing for an unidentified client in Canada. 
<laughs> but he offered nothing further on the safe house in Iraq. Yeah. Easily the most tantalizing tidbit in the chapter. And he did not elaborate beyond identifying himself as a civilian advisor on the war zone economic development he trumpeted while running for state treasurer and mayor. I, I what I like if he really is a CIA agent <laughs> running for president, it would be fun. It would that makes me think he is because he just keeps accidentally revealing it. <laughs> like, that's very, very CIA to just be up there and be like, you know, when I'm talking to my, my great husband, Chasten, when I'm talking to my handlers, when I'm talking to my supporters. <laughs> He's like, let's just say I did great work for a company. You might say the company. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Uh, so, uh, Buttigieg wrote reverentially of the firm, ah! referring to McKinsey. I guess. Well, yeah. what's, what's up? Uh, but saw his future was in public service. No matter how much I liked my clients and my colleagues, he wrote, delivering from them could not furnish the deep level of purpose that I craved. Ooh. McKinsey consultants are now delivering for him. Its employees have donated more to him than any other Democrat running for president. Wow, they must have really liked him there. He must have been cool in the workplace. He must have, that's where he started doing the dance. I've got for a minute. Okay, last last bit of <laughs> last bit of Pete Buttigieg thing. Uh incredibly, someone has found uh his husband, Chasen Buttigieg's Chasen Buttigieg. Instagram page, who posted a loving selfie with the caption, This guy of Pete Buttigieg. Walking through the Berlin Holocaust Memorial, okay. just like San Antonio Spurs basketball player <laughs> Danny Green of the famous post of all time. You know, I had to do it one time. Hashtag Holocaust. Well, <laughs> the hashtag that makes that one of the top 10 posts ever. Yeah. Well, OK, I got to say to defend uh, the Chasen and Pete limited liability partnership. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been to that memorial and it, you, you can't if, help unless someone explicitly told you it's a Holocaust memorial, you'd have no idea. Yeah. I mean, it's a German's idea of like trying to be like emotionally profound. So it's just Giant like, cubes. oh, what if there was a lot of concrete in the center of the city? Like they feel bad, but it's just like they have no ability to artistically express that. So you can't walk. Th it's not like being in fucking Dachau or something. Yeah. It's not like making an emotionally profound video in Auschwitz like Clay Higgins. <laughs> <laughs> like cooking yeah, gumbo you go, you go. So let in me the tell gas you right chambers. Now, oh, man, man, I mean, you, got that, uh, you go that Auschwitz down there. You go, go down that Auschwitz down there. Oh, man, I mean. Right. It's not like bringing your friend. It's not like bringing your friend. Who's you get that into Fago. It's not like bringing your friend who's a talking crocodile to the mass graves. <laughs> like Clay right. Higgins did. I tell you right now, they got some goulash in there. Oh, man, I mean. Alligator. Man, I mean. <laughs> uh, but. It is right. It's one of those things where it's like, well, imagine if Bernie did it. Like, imagine, <laughs> imagine if Bernie took a picture of Jane and also a, a singing alligator who he's friends with, and talked about his gumbo recipe, which Pete also did. Pete was the cameraman. Pete was the cameraman for the Clay Higgins video. A lot of people don't know this. <laughs> Just like. <laughs> just yeah yeah uh, uh bernie and jane at the uh, holocaust memorial the caption is like they want what we got <laughs> <laughs> my day oh, no, one no, no, bitch no, 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 no. uh bernie taking a photo of the berlin holocaust memorial caption if i'm paying who's going <laughs> <laughs> i just want to i just want to get a girl get a girl we're gonna we're gonna drink margaritas at the holocaust memorial <laughs> if she wakes up at 8 a.m every day i'm giving her a louis v bag every week <laughs> we i will take her to get her toes done <laughs> well imagine if bernie sanders just posted multiple videos where he's dancing around in asa shorts and you can see his dick print and he <laughs> claimed to be a surgeon i'm gonna buy my girl a college <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah uh no, no girlfriend at the moment. Just taking my mom on cute little dates to the Holocaust memorial. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to, I swear to God, life, life is lit when you're the senator from Vermont and you're single. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Well, I mean, so yeah, that's. Uh, that, I get paid fifty thousand dollars a bill in the Senate. My money is good. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there you go. Uh, Pete Buttigieg uh, just uh, again, I cannot help but read like again weird polls stating that he's like leading in Iowa. 
just I can't imagine who actually supports this guy, but now we know it's like probably the CIA. Yes. And yeah, they can and, put a hell of a thumb on the And like, here's also, but like, I mean, like those, we saw, like, Pete supporters are diehard. Like, they are. Oh, yeah, I know. They're fully, they're I think boys. because what we alluded to, there's no more powerful feeling than wanting to go back to the past. Yeah. That's stronger than anything. No one else really has it. Yeah, Biden were, a, he, a he little. Could recruit, but, he could make 2009 real. Yeah. And that's a powerful incentive. Virgil said that uh, that the Kamala people were sort of like the Germans at the end of World War II, where they still had the sense of duty, but they were really willing to give up. And the P people are like the Japanese. Yeah, are going to have to yeah, drop yeah. two nukes yeah. on yeah. and are still going to hole up in a caves and for 20 years after the war. Go home, Yankee. Your wife is on a bumble date with a consultant. 